Welcome to the podcast for Refuge City Church. We hope that the message today blesses you and inspires you to be a refuge that embraces others. I'd like you, if you would, to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I want to teach you something this morning and extract some things from the Word of God that I think is going to help us and assist us going forward in, in this 21 days of fasting. Um, I've entitled this message real simple, um, and, and kind of a, kind of an exclamation. You want me to fast, but I love food. Um, <clears throat> there it is right there. You know, you want, you want me to fast? I mean, you know, sometimes we, we just got to quit hopping around it and just call it what it is. You know, man, you want me to fast or I want to fast. But my problem is I really, really love food. Three of you, the rest of you, you do. I, I've watched, I've, I've watched you at a potluck and you can put it away. I'll just tell you that right now. And, uh, but it's more than that. And I want to, I want to speak to that. And I want to speak to the importance and the pertinence of, of fasting and, and the biblical principles to fasting. We, we understand there's lots of disciplines within the word of God. And many times when we hear discipline, obviously disciplines, um, an abbreviated context of disciple. How many of you desire to be a disciple of Christ? Let's go there first. How many of you realize that there's an expectation that if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, that you're going to follow after the disciplines that Jesus told us to do and the things that he instructed us to do, they go together. Being a disciple means we'll be disciplined. And in the context of that, though, there's, there's one thing that I think is imperative in anything that we do in life, whether it's a discipline, whether it's an enjoyment, whatever that is, it's a matter of motive. Everybody say motive. You know, I, I, uh, my, uh, my wife um, here recently I, uh, there's a certain section of time and it, it's, it's this time of year for me that I will get up at four o'clock in the morning. I, I will put on, um, clothing that, um, is of camouflaged nature. I will go out in the wilderness in sleet that's spitting sideways. And anybody in here know that we have rain that actually goes up into your ear, not actually... And I, I will stand out in the cold. I will shiver. My fingers will go numb. My nose will turn purple. And I will stand there in hopes that there's an ignorant animal that may walk by me on such a terrible day. Um, and my motive is I, I want to be there when that animal walks by. So I'm willing to endure all of that horrific torture. And some of you are shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about. I, I will endure the rain and the sun. I will get up. My, my wife, her first thing about hunting is, I love to hunt, but see me at noon. I'm not, if animals, to her, animals don't get up till 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And then they go to bed at four, because that's when she wants to come back to camp. But, and there may be some truth to that. I might need to start doing it her way, but. But her motive isn't the same as my motive is what I'm trying to say just in an illustration and an example that if our motive is to do something and, and I, I want to I want to tell you this and you've heard this in many ways if our motives to do something we will do it for all of you that like to go deep sea fishing you will chum all day because you like deep sea fishing some of you are shaking your head no well maybe you won't but but if we like something, if we like to golf, if we like to go shopping, ladies, you will get up. See, this is the difference. Wild horses will not drag me out of bed on Black Friday. Black Friday means it's dark outside and I need to watch football. That's what Black Friday means to me. But to my spouse, she will get up in the rain, in the snow, to get in line. Everybody, everybody say motive. motive. So every, everybody got it now. If your motive is set in a particular way, it doesn't matter the sacrifices or the disciplines that, that may come because of that particular motive. You're going to do it because you want to do it. So the disciplines and the sacrifices within scripture, the motive is I want to do it. I desire to do it because Jesus said I need to do it and I must do it. Everyone hear that? How many know there are, there are some things in scripture that are suggestions? How many know there really are? I can give you a bunch of them. They're suggestions. There are a bunch of things in scripture that Jesus either indicates or the father indicates are musts. How many know musts are different than suggestions? 
you must do this, or I desire to you to do this, or I long for you to do this. Motive has a huge and overwhelming purpose and reason to why we do what we do. If our motive for something's not based on the heart of desire and passion, listen to this, then what we do will become only a duty, a frustration, and ultimately will end in resentment. If I'm doing something from the Lord and I really don't have the right motive for it, all it's going to become is a duty and a frustration where after a while I get resentful doing it. Even the greatest thing for the Lord, no matter what we do for the Lord, no no matter how we do things for the Lord, he never intended for them to be duties and frustration that ultimately ended in resentment. He wanted us to do them with joy and he wanted us to do them with a passion. Give me an amen on that. You want me to fast, but I love food. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody say Sermon on the Mount. We're going to dive into this this morning. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites. So basically Jesus here, and and I, I want to stop right here and just give a little excerpt for the Sermon on the Mount. So many people come to me and say, Pastor Jim, where, where do we start in the Bible? There are lots of places to start reading the Bible. Um, I, I recommend the book of John, the whole book of John. If you take that, go through that. Um, I recommend Proverbs. You can do Proverbs in a month. If there's 31 days in the month, some days there's 29 or 30, but most months there's 31. And so you can read a chapter. You can do a proverb every day, but I'll be very honest with you. I, I have been led for the last probably eight or 10 years to tell people, especially if they're, they're newer believers in Christ. Where do I start reading the Bible? Start at Matthew 5 and go till Matthew chapter 7, through Matthew chapter 7 to Matthew chapter 8. Read all of that because you are going to get the insight into who Jesus is. And how many of you know this is the spot where he actually verbally declares that this application, it doesn't say it here, but this is, this is what he said later. He did not come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it. So this is where he starts talking about things like divorce, about things like um, being a servant. And he comes and he, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says to them, if, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, pick that up and carry it one mile, I declare to you, you need to carry it two. If someone slaps you, turn the other you can read all of that. There, there are so many amazing things in the Sermon on the Mount. But right in the middle of this, um, he's talking about prayer. And then he goes into fasting. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. So he says, if you're going to fast, don't walk around and show everybody that you're pathetic because you're fasting. You know, you go to work and people are like, man, you're cranky. I know my church is making me fast. You know, I just want to punch pastor right now. I don't, but yeah, that's, that's fine too. But, but all, all of a sudden the motive, what Jesus is teaching the motive, motive of fasting, if you're doing it and you're not excited about it, if it's not something you really want to do, then you're missing it. For they disfigure their faces. This is what he says about the hypocrites with the sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. So they, they purposely look like they're fasting and pathetic. So everybody will go, Oh, they're so spiritual and they're so close to God and and they're better than me because they fast. And, and Jesus is saying, please, please don't do that. He said, assuredly, I say to you that they will, they will have their reward. Verse 17, but you, when you fast, everybody say, when you, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, take a shower or something on Get cleaned up. Look happy. Jesus is saying, how many, how many of you know, this is important here. How many of you know, when, when you, when you wash your, when you take a shower, you feel different. So he's not necessarily saying that, but he's saying, refresh yourself because when you get refreshed, it changes and it uplifts your countenance. Okay. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. So he says, this is something that you should do between you and God. It's something personal. It's something secret. It's something private. But to your father who is in the secret place and your father who is, who sees in secret will reward you openly. Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount three, many different things, but there are three exercises necessary to being a disciple. There are three major things that he talks about kind of continually from Matthew chapter five, all the way through Matthew chapter seven. And these principles are giving. He talks about giving a lot in the sermon on the Mount. 
He talks about praying. So if you're a disciple, this is what he's saying. So the Sermon on the Mount is for people that have found Jesus and accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and want to get closer to the Father through the Son. You can read the whole thing, but that's the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is for him to teach people. This is how on earth, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth earth as it is in heaven. So all this sermon is, this is how you get heaven on earth. This is what you need to do. You need to give, give me an amen. And I'm not just talking about money, but there's lots of things we can give. We can give our time. We can, we can help people. We can do lots of stuff. You, you need to pray. Give me an amen. You need to seek him. You need to ask for him. And then the, the third principle that we're going to dive into today and do a little teaching on is fasting. So giving, praying, and fasting. Fasting is a biblical principle that continually throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, and just the word of God in general, is taught for the purpose of spiritual discipline and seeking a deeper understanding and direction and purpose in our lives. When we want God's intervention, we are to seek him, to find him, to pray, but we're also to fast. There are areas of victory. Listen to this. There are areas of victory in your life that will never be released and realized except through fasting and prayer. How many of you need some victories in your life? Come on, raise your hand. That's not a trick question. I'm not trying to trick you. You need some victories in your life. Many of you raised your hands earlier uh, that you needed that, that mustard seed faith that we had a powerful word about this morning. Jesus over and over in scripture, but specifically in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, which was quoted to us today in the word. And the disciples said, how come we couldn't cast, how come we couldn't fix this boy? How, how come we couldn't change him? And everything that was said to you w- was accurate this morning, right to the word of God. And he said this, he goes, except through prayer and fasting, you, you can't do this except through prayer and fasting. This is that spot. We just heard about it in a, a few moments ago, that if you want God's intervention, if you want God to do something, then you need to pray and you need to to fast. Jesus does not, listen to this. I think this is interesting. Jesus here is not asking us to fast. Okay. Two times here, he says, when you fast, three little verses of scripture I read. And two times he says, when you fast, not if you fast, you can fast. It's when you fast. So everybody say there's an expectation We'll do it, even if we don't like it. Now turn to the person next to you and say, quit whining about it. There you go. Okay. All right. It's very important that we understand this this morning. Jesus does not ask us to fast. He tells us to fast. Jesus did not say, if you fast in our text, he said, when you fast. I want to give you a couple of things that will help you in your navigation with fasting this morning. Maybe you've never understood it, never grasped it. That's my whole point today is for you to leave here and go, man, I got it. I understand it now. I realize it. I never, I never knew it, but now I got it. Here's the first thing. What does fasting do for us? There's a lot of things that, that fasting will do, do for you. There's many things that I could have touched on here. I could have spoken on. I could have taught on here. You know, fasting is, is a way of cleansing Fasting, fa- fasting will cleanse you. Fasting will cleanse your, your body. It'll, it, it's, a, it's a form of detox and, and it'll show things. And, and so this is interesting. This is interesting. Many of you in here have fasted whether you wanted to or not. You know how I know that? Because you have to fast before they'll take your... So the doctor says, after such and such at night, you have to fast. And that's because fasting gives an accurate assessment of your lifeblood. Hmm. How many of you think if it's, if it's a medically induced thing, maybe it does something for us spiritually as well? Ooh, pastor. What does fasting do for us? Here's the first thing. Fasting exposes our hearts. Now, any, anybody in here ever had a fast imposed upon you? And you didn't want it, meaning you went for a, a long segment of time or you went a, for a day without a couple. Of, anybody in here ever gotten hangry? How come every hand just went up there? This is a man. I'm on God. We're on something good. You're on something good today. Everybody understands hangry, don't we? 
You miss a couple of meals and everybody better look out. Okay? That's... (laughs) It's kind of self-imposed, whether the doctor did it or, or whether you just missed it. But, but let, me, let me show you this. Fasting exposes our heart. You go too long without eating and the real you comes out. dun 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 you, How many of you know you go without eating very long and, and very few people are still sweet? You go without eating and the sour parts come out. The real you comes out. And that's important because one of the things that fasting does for us, and this is why Jesus teaches it this way, wash your, wash your face, don't, don't look pathetic. That's Pastor Jim's word, not Christ's word, but you can read into that. You know, don't. But there's a reason why he wants you to fast, and that's because he wants you to see what you've tried to bury and what you've tried to subdue. He wants you to see the real you in there. How many know it's not so other people can see the real you. It's so you can see how you're trying to fake yourself out. What really controls you, what really manipulates you. Richard Foster says this more than any other discipline. Fasting reveals the things that control us. Fasting helps us uncover what is really inside. For example, if you are one who eats in order to feel better or because you're bored or you're sad or discouraged, then the absence of food will reveal those emotions even at a greater stint. And it'll show us what we need to manage and surrender. So I, I want to share something with you. Fasting is important, especially if we eat in order to feel better. How many know that we do that? Okay. Okay. We eat because we're bored. We, we don't have anything else to do. So guess what we have to do? We have to do something. So we're, we got to eat. We got to have a bag of potato chips. That's why we can't eat one chip because we're bored. So we eat the whole bag. That's a good word there. Or because we're discouraged, we're depressed. You get discouraged or depressed, guess what happened? Something triggers in your body, your mind in your body, that I need some self-pleasure. I'm going through something, and what brings me pleasure is food. Listen to this. The absence of food will reveal those emotions that need to be managed and surrendered. Lord, I I didn't know this was in here. I, I didn't know if I started fasting. I didn't know that I that I ate so much to make myself feel better. I don't want to eat to make myself feel better. I want you to make me feel better no matter what I'm going through. It can also reveal just how much pride, anger, and resistance we have inside of us. You ain't going to tell me to fast. I'll fast when I want to fast. Have you ever fasted? Nope, and I don't intend to because I ain't... See, everybody got how it comes out? Fasting has the ability to bring things to the top of our lives that we may not otherwise have wanted to admit or reveal. That's the first thing. Here's the next thing. Fasting authenticates our genuine desire for more of God. God, if you said to do it, and it wasn't a suggestion, then it's my heart to do it because I desire more. I desire you more than anything. I desire more than you. I desire you more than I do pizza. More than I do well, I was going to say salad, but that's a lie right there. But <laughs> something else. Fasting authenticates our genuine desire for more of God. So, so why do we fast? Listen to this. Because th- this is why. H- how many of you in here love God? Amen. Not a trick question. How many of those of you watching? You can chime in right now. How many of you love God? Say, that's me. That's me. I want to hear you. How many of you that love God? Know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he knows you love him. Okay, there's a few of you. That's good. How many of you know the ones that didn't raise their hand at the end of 21 days better raise their hand? And it's not a manipulative thing, but when I fast, it's my way of saying, God, I love you more than what I want. This is really good. Fasting authenticates our, our, our genuine desire. God, I, I love you more than I love whatever this is. Whether it's a, a true fast or a total fast or a partial fast, we're going to get into that at the very end of the message today. But I am giving this up because I want you to know I love you and you're first. I say it. How many of you, how many in here have ever said, God, I love you? How many of you said, God, I love you out loud? 
okay? How many of you have ever fasted with the motive of showing God how much you love him? There's no other reason. See here, we're going to get into the reasons in a minute, but, but I was challenged by this. There was a mentor in my life. He was an elderly man at a rest care home. The staff has heard about him a lot. But when I was pastoring in Colorado, I, I, um, I was leading worship with the piano and I, 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 I was not a good pianist at that point. And my pastor knew it and he didn't know how to tell me how bad I stunk at it. So this is, was his great idea. He came to me one day and he says, I have booked four assisted care facilities and rest home every week for you to go play hymns. So he didn't want to hear it, but he wanted me to torture all the old people. <laughs> this is true. So there were, so for months I went and played the piano. That was his way of making me practice without anyways, pastors are smart. All of you staff in here, never mind. So he was, he was brilliant. So I, I went and played and, and one of these rest homes had a retired Baptist minister that was in his nineties. And one day we were, we were sitting talking about stuff in ministry. And um, he said, pastor, he said, I have a question for you. Have, have you, especially as a pastor, you need to do it. But have, have you, have you ever fasted? And I, I was like, yeah, you know, when the church made a devotion and told, told me to, I, I did a little bit. And so he questioned me, he said, what have you fasted over? And I said, well, I fasted for seven days for confirmation on who I was to marry. He's like, that's a good motive. We're going to get to that in a minute. I, I fasted. There was something that I, I, I felt like God wanted me to do in, in my specific in a calling and so I felt like I needed to fast for that. And he said, what else have you fasted for? And, and I gave him a couple of other reasons that I had fasted and they were all so that I could hear from God. And, and that's pure. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And he smiled and he said, I thought, thought you'd say that. Well, I'd gotten, I'd gotten close enough to this, this powerful man. Finally, I looked at him. I said, what are you looking for? He said, there's one thing that you haven't said about fasting that to me, was the sole reason why I learned to do it so much as a pastor and you're going to need it. And I said, okay, what's that? And he said, you need to fast just to tell him and show him how much you really love him. No strings attached. You don't want an answer. You don't need a revelation. You don't need a call to something. You don't need him to confirm your marriage, which you've already done. But when, when have you, Pastor Jim, I want to challenge you as a, as a fellow minister in my 90s, when's the last time that you fasted just to say, God, I'm doing this because I want you to know how much I love you. And I put my head down and I go, I've never done that. And he goes, I would urge you to start. Fasting authenticates our genuine desire for God. It's a way for us to tangibly show God how much we love and honor him above everything. In other words, this is our physical expression to show God that we appreciate him without any strings attached. That's why we should fast. Here's, here's the second thing we need to know. What fasting does not, everybody say not. What fasting does not do for us. So there's a couple things I want to give you to this. This is what fasting will not do for you. Here's the first thing. Fasting is not going to cause God to love you any deeper or more. Now, I can show him through fasting how much I love him, but me fasting isn't going to convince God to love me more than he loves you or love me any more than he already loves me. First John already said he is love and he already loves the way he loves. Can I hear a big amen? That should bless all of us. First John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Fasting, listen to this, fasting will not inspire or provoke God to love you any more than he already does. If you fast as an obligation, trying to earn God's love, it will feel oppressive. The exact opposite feeling that God wants you to experience. Here, here's the main point with this. 
We don't fast to get God to set his heart towards us, but rather because God has already set his heart towards us, we're secure in our desire and commitment for more of him. We want to experience his grace and his love more deeply. Hebrews eleven six. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I just want everybody to say, there, there's religions out there. How many of you know most religions impose some type of fast? How, how many know that? Hindus fast, Muslims fast, Jews fast. I can keep going on and on. Most of them impose a fast. You will fast. It's not an option. If you're a Muslim, this is when you'll fast. If you're a Hindu, this is when you'll fast. They impose that fast. And many of those fasts, if you read the history about it, it's because they're wanting God to to invoke or to do something for them. That's the purpose of the fast. I, I want to share something with you and, and, and to show love or favor to them. We're fasting so that God favors us more than he favors someone else or more than he loves someone else. I just want to tell you that can never be the purpose of fasting. God will never love you any differently than he loves everyone else. Here's the next one. And this is the, probably the purest reason of what fasting will not do. It will not manipulate God to do what you want the way you want it. Sorry. Sorry. You can impose a past forever and you can wither up into nothing, but that's not going to manipulate God to get what you want, how you want it. Listen to this. Fasting isn't a get get rich scheme to convince God how serious you are about wanting something. I'm going to be real practical. Starving yourself in order to try to convince God or manipulate him to do what you really want never produced the desired effects. God cannot be guilted. Hear hear this. God cannot be guilted into doing things our way, even through fasting. Can I hear an amen? Amen. How many know God has already made us holy and blameless through Christ with the finishing work of the cross? That's enough. Everyone needs to hear this today. If, if, if God never did another thing for me than giving me his only begotten son to be my propitiation and my substitution and to be my sanctification and my justification, there's nothing else I need in this life. Can I hear an amen? Than what he's already given me. That's good stuff. So here's the next one. Number three, why, why does God desire for us to fast? This is why God desires in his word. He desires and appreciates for us to, to fast. Why does God desire for us to fast? So we can have a greater appreciation of his presence and his blessings. There's a spot in fasting. And, and, for, and for me, it's always been at a different place. But there's a spot when you start to fast. That the presence and the blessings of God begin to open up for you. That's absolutely earth shattering. I will be very honest with you. I'm not going to try to build it up than it is, but when you really get pure about fasting and you really do it in all honesty, and, and this is why God desires us to fast is so that we can draw closer to him and we can understand and feel his blessings. How many of you really want the presence of God in your life? How many of you want the blessings of God? Not stuff, but blessing. There's a difference between stuff and blessing. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Scripture repeatedly reminds us to seek him with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our our souls. I'm going to give you some examples within scripture. How many of you know when Ezra fasted, God gave protection over his family and possessions? One of the most powerful books, we heard it yesterday at men's breakfast. There was a young young man that was talking about reading Ezra and what Ezra did. When Ezra called for a fast, he called for a fast for two things. Number one, he called for a fast for his family and for God to protect and bring protection to his nation. I want to, I want to share something with this fast this morning. There's two things that I think are imperative if we're going to follow scripture. Number one, and this isn't necessarily in order, but number one thing that I I really feel like that God wants to do in this fast is just this. God wants to realign families and our family. Can I hear an amen? Amen. You'll be surprised at what will come to the top in your family. 
You, th this is a powerful testimony. And, and they're still doing, as far as I know, they're still doing it today. There's a family in our church that, I don't know, it was probably three or four years ago, we did a 21-day Daniel fast. How many remember the Daniel fast? And it was right before Easter. And, and so the, the dad, the, the dad he, he prayed about what to do. And he sat down with his children like two nights before the fast. And he said, how serious are we about doing this? And they, they didn't quite understand, I don't think, at the beginning of what he was asking. But they were like, Dad, you know, if, if you're in, we're in. And he says, okay, well, um, if we're going to do the Daniel fast, that means that we don't have bacon. That really affected his son, he told me privately. So we're not doing bacon. Okay, we're not, there's certain things that we're not going to do. You know, we're going to eat vegetables or so forth and so on. And he said, and there may be some things. Do you trust me? There may be some other things that I think that we need to do through this fast that will un unite and heal some things within our family. And the kids were like, yeah, that's, that sounds good. And so the day of the fast, he walks in and he unplugged their TVs and took them out of the room. He took all of their devices and he confiscated their phone. First couple of days, I bet, was hell on earth. He didn't say that to me. But this is what happened. 21 days on the Daniel fast, they had no television, no computer, no anything. About three or four days into the fast, he caught the kids. Can you believe these children? He caught the kids at the table playing a board game. It was awful. I, I heard the gasp over here. It was, I, I can't even believe that they still have those. But he caught his children playing a board game and he invited himself into the game. It was a work week because it was in the middle before Easter. It was a work day and it was a school day. They ended up playing games till 1.30 in the morning. Shame on you, father and mother. So they started playing games. So 21 days, fast forward 21 days. At the end of 21 days, it was Easter Sunday. We ended the fast on Easter Sunday. And so the fast actually ended at a certain time during the day after service. We, we went all the way through service and so forth. They went home. They sat down and they were going to have ham. I remember him telling me that. His son was really excited about that. They were going to have ham on Easter. And he brought out all of their TVs and computer screens and everything and he set him up and he said, pastor, he goes, the craziest thing happened. He goes, not one of my children touched one of those devices until Tuesday. Everybody understanding what begins to happen. That all of a sudden, remember what I talked about motive and priority at the beginning? That the motive and the priorities started to shift and they actually started to be friends in their house. I know it's crazy. When Ezra fasted, did God gave protection over his family and his possessions? How many know when Daniel fasted, God gave him wisdom and understanding. Here's a big one. When Eleazar fasted, anybody remember who Eleazar is in the word? Somebody in here, raise your hand. Eleazar was the servant that Abraham sent to go find Isaac's wife. That's Eleazar. So when Eleazar got to the country he was in, God called him to a fast so that he could point out. He said, I will fast. And so God pointed out Rebecca due to the fast. All the guys in here got excited that's looking for a wife. Anyway, come see me after service. <laughs> How many of you know, I think the greatest example out of all the examples I could give us in scripture, Paul and Peter and all of those. The greatest example that I think we see is our own Lord and Savior. Before he launched his ministry, it says he went out in the wilderness for 40 days and he fasted. We fast because we know deep within us, there's nothing on earth that can satisfy our longings except God and his Holy Spirit. No one else can heal our land like God. Can I hear an amen? amen. No one else can heal our land like God. Nothing else can free us from the bondages of sin and shame like our God. Can I hear an amen? amen? Through fasting, we get a better revelation and understanding of what we need to do and how we need to be. That's the first one. Here's the second, second reason. To increase our faith. Everybody say our faith. Matter of fact, say it like this. My faith. My faith. 
So let's, we need to reword that. To increase my faith. My faith. How many know during a fast, many people have visions and dreams of heaven? You know, the times that we've done fasts as a church here, it's amazing to me how many people, people that, people, we have people that are real poets in our church. Jane Craig Miles, I think she's here today. She writes songs and poems that are absolutely amazing. It's awesome to me during a fast at how God starts to release things within people and people that desired or long to be a prophetic artist or to do art, or to do poems, or whatever. They sit down, and because of them being cleansed in a fast, not only in their body, but in their mind, their spirit starts to speak. Ooh, this is good. Anybody in here ever wanted to do something really powerful for God? You got an opportunity, because it'll increase your faith. They have visions and dreams of heaven, things that are to come, and spiritual insight that they otherwise would not have. This will greatly increase faith. I want you to turn to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. We're going to read verse 6. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Who's speaking here? God. God. Everybody say God. God speaking through the the prophet Isaiah. And this is what he says in Isaiah 58 verse 6. Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? So this, this is God speaking. Jesus was talking about it in... Matthew, we started there, and this is God speaking through the prophet. This is the kind of fast I've chosen. Number one, to loose the chains of injustice. How many know there's some injustice going on in the United States and around the world? So this is what we're praying for. I'm giving you directly out of scripture. Lord, you begin to make the injustices just again. Give me an amen. Okay. To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Verse 7. Is it not to share your food with the hungry? So how many of you know what would be good is some of us in here, we take some of our food budget that we would usually spend, specifically going out to eat. A lot of people, one of the things that they do, especially in a partial fast, is is they decide to go on a Daniel fast, which how many of you know Daniel, Daniel fast was just vegetables, and that's fine. We'll get to it in a minute. But... But in having vegetables, they also decided we will not go out to eat at all. Do you know how much money people spend on pizza and hamburgers and coffee? Well, let's not talk about coffee, but pizza and hamburgers. (laughs) No, we'll get there in a minute. People in this congregation have said, Pastor Jim, we, we were amazed at how much more money we had in the budget that we were able to help somebody else with. Right here. Is it not to share, this is what fasting, God's talking about fasting, 58. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Verse eight, then your light will break forth like the dawn. How many of you have ever prayed to be a light and salt to the world? Here it is right here. Fasting will do that. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly Not just your physical healing. He's talking about physical healing. But how many of you know God wants to use us to release his healing? Can I hear an amen? We heard it this morning. And your healing will come, break forth the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your... How many in here have ever wanted God to have your back? This is how we fast. Give me an amen. Verse 9. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, why are we fasting during this time of year in an election? Drum roll, please. (laughs) Doing away with the pointing of a and malicious. Oh, God's so good. I love fasting. Verse 10. And if you spend, listen to this, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the, the noonday. Here's, here's the ne- next one. So that we can become more sensitive and available to God's direction and desire for us. I want everyone to listen to this. E- everyone hear me. Every single person in this room has an assignment from God. Fasting. You may, when I said that many of you went, I don't feel that, or I don't know what that assignment is. 
I promise you at some point in the next 21 days, if you take this fast clear, you will understand the assignment God has for you. You will get it. You will get it. How many of you in here, I should have asked this different. How many of you in here really want an assignment from God? Praise God. Good heart. So that we can become more sensitive and available to God's direction and desire for us. Second Chronicles chapter 20. This is a fast. This is the fast that the, that the Hebrews, the nation of Israel took under Jehoshaphat. We're going to read it. Second Chronicles 20, three and four and verse 13. And Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. Guess what he did? He proclaimed a fast throughout all Ju- Judah. So basically the king got with the priests. Jehoshaphat went and talked to the priests and asked the priest, what should we do? And actually it came out in a prayer meeting. It's amazing to me how God answers stuff in a prayer meeting. So they're in a prayer meeting and this came out that they would fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the, how many of you know, nothing can happen greater than a group of people in Klamath Falls and across this nation begin to fast and just ask God for help. How many know if we've ever needed help in the United States of America, it's right now in the next 21 days. So Judah gathered to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse 13. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, their children stood before the Lord. Do you know what that means? Everybody fasted. Matter of fact, there's another verse that says they made the animals fast. Some of your cats are fat. Never mind. We won't go there. That's (laughs) don't know why that hit me. But anyway, (laughs) how many know God has an assignment for your life? Can I hear an amen? This morning, perhaps you sense from the spirit that you should fast, but you don't really have an understanding of why here, here, here's what I want. I want those of you that are here this morning and you're like, well, I I don't know why to do this. In that case, this is why you need to fast to ask the Lord to clarify the objectives that's going on around you. That's going on in the world and specifically that's going on in your life and your family. Lord, what's happening? What, What are you recalibrating? What are you doing in this house? Here are some reasons that could provoke the need for a fast. So in scripture, there are a lot of reasons, but here here are some of them. Seek God for direction in the areas of your life in the future. I want to share something with you. You know, what's wrong with the church. We've spent too much time looking in the rear, looking in the rear instead of looking in the, anybody got what I'm saying? We've spent way too much time looking in the rear view mirror instead of the front windshield of our lives. We're spending, anybody ever get together? Listen, listen to this. At Thanksgiving, you try this. At Thanksgiving, you try this. Just try it. All of your family sitting around the table, listen to what they start talking about. I remember the year we, how many of you know that's not bad, but somebody at the table ought to go, well, why don't we do that again? Some of the greatest plans for families got planned at Thanksgiving table. And the reason is they got tired of listening about what they used to do. And they started making plans for what they can and will do. Oh man. Seek God for direction in new areas of your life. Seek God, seek God for help and intervention for your country and nation. Can I hear an amen? amen? Seeking assistance and intervention for your family and your future. God has specific assignments for you that needs to be confirmed. Here are some of those assignments that God through fasting may reveal. Who should I marry? Who should I marry? I want you to think about it. Some of you are sitting here. Maybe you're dating. Maybe you're engaged. All of you teenagers, I want to come over here. I had a, I had a young man, I had a young man recently walk up to me and talk to me about dating. Very awesome, amazing young man. And he said, Pastor Jim, what are your thoughts on dating? And I said, dating only gets you into practice for divorce. I'm not a fan of dating. Dating only gets you in the practice for divorce. I'll explain before all of you are looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Dating goes from one person to the other person, feeling out all those people until you think you find the person, which most of the time means you're violating covenants with God. So they looked at me and said, so what do you think? I said, well, you should court. 
And they were like, what's courting? And I said, well, I can tell you what courting is. Courting's this. I said, go write a list of everything you want in a spouse. Okay. And they were like, okay. So I was urged to do this. I had made some dating mistakes and I came to a wise pastor and said, you know, this isn't working out for me. I've got some regrets. I know I've created some regrets. And he said, well, that's because you're trying to do it the world's way, which only leads to you to practicing divorce. That's why there's a brand new sitcom that's coming out. CBS is so excited about it. And you, you, can, you can look at it. You can watch the advertisement. It's so-and-so and so-and-so and their first marriage. That's the title of the sitcom. Because the world's even getting us into the practice that this one's going to end. Dating gets us in the practice that this will probably end, but courting doesn't. You know why? And this is what this pastor told me. He said, you go home and write a list of everything you want in a spouse. And I went, like, like everything? Now, you got to know I was 17 years old, so there were some things in my mind that probably... I'm just being real. Anybody in here remember when you were 17? Don't look at me all holy in church right now. So I remember looking at this guy going like, like even some physical attributes. And he said, you write everything. And so I looked at him and I went, I, I, uh, that doesn't seem really holy. And he goes, well, we're going to refine your list. (laughs) I'm going to help you through it. And he said this, he goes, I don't want you to write your list until you fast for three days. That was, that was one of the first times in my life I had really ever fasted. And so for three days, I didn't eat anything. I just drank water. And throughout that three days, I started writing that list. And this is what happened. This is the truth. This is what happened. I wrote that list, came back with him. He confirmed it. And the very next girl that I met that I had a physical attraction to, I matched the list to her and she didn't have anything on the list except for a physical attribute. I'm just being honest. And I had God's plan that I had wrote out. So... We're sitting talking at Dairy Queen and I looked at her and I said, what do you think about being a pastor's wife and being in ministry? And she looked at me and she goes, hell will freeze over. <laughs> her name was Diane. I'll never forget. She goes, Pastor Jim, I'm just being, she didn't say Pastor Jim. She said, Jim, I'm, I'm honest with you. I don't, you don't want to be a pastor, do you? And I just smiled and said, would, would you like to go? True story. And she's like, are, are we done with our date? And I go, pretty much. Because nothing from here is going to benefit because that was number two on my list. Number one was she had to be a woman of God. And number two was she better be called the ministry for God. So I compared the list to the courting. And there was a whole lot of people that I really were attracted to that I, I how many of you know this works? I'll talk to the teenagers later about it. Okay. (laughs) Who should I marry? Where should I live? Should I move or stay? What job should I take? Should I buy that or not buy that? I want to share something with you. A whole bunch of lemons for vehicles would not have been purchased if you had fasted and prayed overnight about it before you signed on the paperwork. Can I hear a big amen? Who has ever been there before? Is there something at this time in your life that you just need direction for? Now, let me, let me give you this. Let me give you this. And this is powerful. The scripture that I read a few moments ago in Chronicles, remember that Jehoshaphat called the fast. The scripture from Chronicles that we just read says this as well. Be still and see the salvation of the. So at the end of the fast, God comes to give the answer to their fast. And he says, be still and know and see the salvation of the Lord. You will not have to fight in this battle. I will fight this battle for you. They didn't even have to fight. God was going to fight for them. The bat- listen to this. The battle took one day 
And God not only delivered them, but he also blessed them. It took them three days, one day to win the battle and three days to carry off all the spoils and the blessings. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. Mm. I'm ready for some of those kind of victories where it takes longer to bring home the blessing than it took, took to fight the enemy. We need to press in like Jehoshaphat in times of great distress and our whole family and our church, and we need to seek him with fasting. Fasting says this, not my will, but yours be done, Father. Teach me your ways. And here's the last thing. Pastor Colton, you can come. Here's the last thing this morning. Thank you for this teaching today. How, how will you fast? How will you fast? There are, two, there are two ways to fast this morning. And I can give you some transcripts. We've got some things provided on the way out there, but... There, there are two types of fast scripturally. The first one is a total fast. Everybody say a total fast. A total fast throughout scripture means no food, only liquids, water, juice, smoothie, smoothies, broth, all that is fine. It can last for one, two, or excuse me, one, three, 21 or 40 days. Those are the, those are the context in scripture that we get the guidelines. One day fast, three day fast, 21 day fast, and 40 day fast. And this is usually the kind of fast that people within scripture were called to do, especially when it came to healing their nations. Okay. God, you intervene for the people. You intervene for the king. You, you intervene for our nation. It was usually a total fast. And then there are partial fasts. In a partial fast, you omit certain foods, desires, and habits as a discipline and a sacrifice and an offering. Everybody say offering back to God. So in the truest sense, fasting is a process of abstaining from something for the purpose of reacquiring worship, fellowship, prayer, and self-discipline in your life. Let's say those again. What's the point? What's the point of fasting? Worship. Everybody say worship fellowship. Do you know how much time, do you know how much time this takes? My brother and I, this was years ago. My parents lived in, in Springfield and we didn't get a chance to talk and hang out very much. And we were sitting in my parents' front room. My, my grandparents, parents were still alive and, and they're bustling and, and mom and my grandmother were doing stuff and there was noise and all the kids and the tree and, and literally I'm sitting in one chair and he's sitting on the couch across from me and we're texting back and forth to one another. The, true story. And he was going through some stuff and I was going through some stuff and he texted me and he says, you, you want to go get a burrito? Because I'm getting tired of doing it this way. And I went, I do like burritos. <laughs> no, we, weren't, we weren't in a fast. But it's amazing to me when you start, I'm, I'm not picking on these. It's amazing when you start that you actually start to communicate with one another again. For example, my wife has some medical things, but my wife... When we, when we call a fast, she always immediately knocks out sweets, desserts, and coffee. So you can pray for me. Because the first three days without coffee, it's, there's a lot of prayer and need there. So other people fast movies, social medias, or hobbies they enjoy. Listen to this, but it's always a sacrifice that's worth it because you're laying something down to show God, I need you, I love you, and I want you more than this stuff. The point is this. Listen to this. The point is that we have selected something in our life to abstain from in order to draw closer to our Heavenly Father, to seek Him, to find Him, and to know Him. Stand with me today. <laughs> I felt, I felt led to do a couple things this morning. I'll never, we'll never, never have a service here at Refuge City Church that we don't ask people and don't give people an opportunity to make Jesus Lord of their life. So before, before we can do a, 
a discipline like fasting, we better make sure that we're right with God. And if you're here this morning, I want everybody looking up here, nobody closing your eyes. If you're here this morning and you're like, Pastor, there's some things I need to repent of. I don't care if you've been saved forever, but we're going to start cleansing before we fast. Our spirit. How many know it's going to cleanse our body, but we're going to cleanse our spirit. Pastor, there's some things that I need to just give over to the Lord. I, I, need, I need this out of my life. Whatever it is, I, I, I need it cleansed. I need to ask, I need to repent of it today. I need to ask God to forgive me. If you're here this morning and maybe you've never asked the Lord to be Lord of your life, obviously before we start a fast, you need to do that. So if you're here today and you'd say, Lord, you, you, to him, not to me, Lord, I, I, need, I need to ask you to forgive me for this stuff. I need to cleanse this. I need to cleanse my spirit. I, I need to repent of this. I want you to raise your hand real high. Real high, you know, come on, real high. None of this, come on. I, I got to get it out. I'm, t- I'm tired of it. I don't care who sees. I don't care. I want it out, out, out of my life. I want it out. It's become idolatry. How many of you know we're talking about that kind of stuff? Part of fasting is to reveal the idolatry. What you love more than him. I want it out. Okay? Just, just keep that up for just a few moments. And here's the second thing that I want you to pray for. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor, there are some things in my own personal life, there's some things in my family, and I guarantee you there's some things in my nation, I want to ask God to move in this fast. I want you to raise your hand. I want God to move in this fast. I want him to move. I want him to move. I want him to move. Father, I thank you and I praise you in this morning like Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles. You see our hands. You see our hearts. You see our spirits. You see our minds. And Father, first and foremost, today we come before you. And if there's any wicked way in us, Father, if there's any habit, if there's anything, if there's any thoughts, if there's any behaviors that are displeasing to you, we repent right now. Matter of fact, everybody say that. I repent right now in Jesus' name. Everyone say it. I repent right now in Jesus' name. I repent right now in Jesus' name. I ask for your forgiveness, Father. And I want to focus in on you. I want this this 21-day fast that starts on Wednesday. I want to participate, not just because there are other churches in our community or our pastors asking for it. I'm going to choose to participate in this 21 days because I want this out of my life so I don't have to repent of it ever again. I want to be free of it. And Father, whatever I need to get rid of, whatever I need to change, whatever I need to turn off, whatever I need to throw in Klamath Lake, between now and Wednesday, I shall do it. Lord, I ask right now that you'll reach down and you'll bless us. Father, as we launch into this 21-day fast this week, Lord, I pray first and foremost your blessing to be upon all of the churches in our basin. Lord, this is an awesome opportunity for multiple congregations to come together and having done all to stand, we're going to stand. Father, we're going to seek you so we can find you like your word says. And Lord, I pray right now that you will heal this land. Father, you'll heal this land. You'll heal our nation, all the division. Lord, all the aggravation. Lord, all the the things that's trying to steal our, our, our young people's identity. Father, may they be restored and renewed to know that their identity is in Jesus and him alone. That they are made in his image, in the image of God. Created he them, I pray. Father, I pray right now. I pray right now for the outcome of whatever happens on November 5th. No matter what happens, Father, having done all to stand, we will be your church. We will be your church. And Lord, we pray, Lord, just like Isaiah, Lord, that you will release the bondages and you will set forth the oppressed in this. Father, there is lies and oppression that's happening in our nation. And Father, we take authority and we bind it right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask that our light will shine, that last verse. Lord, that no matter what, our light will shine like the noonday, like the brightest at noon. Lord, no matter what happens in November, Father, our light's going to shine. And Lord, we're going to praise you and we're going to exalt you and we're going to magnify you. In Jesus' name. And the church said... Amen. Thank you for joining us. A special thank you to those of you that give generously to this ministry. It is because of you that this ministry is possible. You can click the link in the description to give now or visit refugecity.church for more information on how you can become a part of that team.
If you've enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe, you can share it with your friends, you can take a screenshot and share it on your social stories, and make sure to tag us at Refuge City Church. Thanks for listening.